Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, as a dentist, I've told thousands of people over the past 30 years that water fluoridation was beneficial and safe. Last year I realised that my advice was not based on first-hand knowledge but on repeating the lines which were drummed into me at dental school. In the last 20 or so years, the science has been showing that old theories were wrong, old studies were misleading, and public health measures being implemented in New Zealand are probably doing more harm than good. I came to realise I was not the only dentist who has concerns about water fluoridation and the way it is being promoted to the public, so I set up a study group, Fluoride Information Network for Dentists, with the aim of encouraging dentists to familiarise themselves with and discuss the science behind it particularly as they are alleged to be endorsing it. Today I will present the myths being perpetuated to the public and consider how they stack up in the light of current scientific evidence and real life data. First I'll look at evidence on how much tooth decay is being saved by community water fluoridation. Then I'll show that the real life data is in line with modern research on the fluoride mechanism of action. This will lead on to a brief discussion on dental fluorosis and other health concerns, economic and social issues. I must note that although I invited fluoride advocates from the Health Department, Dental and Medical Associations and Dental School to attend this forum and discuss the scientific evidence, they all declined to attend. I can only assume they suffer from a lack of conviction and a fear of transparency. But all is not lost, as with the wonders of modern technology, as you can see, we can put up the videos and the public statements on the big screen and we can give them due consideration. I also would like to thank the Fluoride Action Network of New Zealand who did provide some speakers for this event and I commend them for all the work they do unpaid to help give the public a balanced view about fluoridation issues. My name is Robin, Dr Robin Gerson Welsh. I'm the Chief Dental Officer for the Ministry of Health. I'm a registered dentist, a wife and mum. I drink fluoridated water. The most recent national study, the 2009 New Zealand Oral Health Survey, showed that on average, New Zealand children have 40% less tooth decay when they were living in fluoridated areas compared to non-fluoridated areas. This could well be the new book of much-loved fairy tales. The Oral Health Survey 2010, if no one's seen it. Within that document, Although the Health Department and New Zealand Dental Association love to refer to this in support of their policies, it is in fact hugely inappropriate. It is not a piece of scientific research nor a metadata study, but a self-proclaimed snapshot of a very small sample of the population at one point in time. In case policy makers can't work it out for themselves, the survey repeatedly states that it was not designed as a scientific study on fluoridation and it cannot be used to determine cause and effect. It would seem the Ministry of Health in commissioning this survey was more interested in getting the headlines it required to perpetuate their fluoridation agenda than in finding out the scientific truth. These tiny sample sizes are not significant. Uh, you can see there the total number examined over the whole population all ages was 987. In the age group 5 to 11 years they looked at 438 children. So assuming that they had a similar number for each age group, they would have looked at about 65 year olds and about 60 year eights. Uh, yeah, year eights. And that's about 0.1 of 1% of each age group. Bad luck if the other 99.9% .9 don't fit into this pattern. That's what the policies are based on. Furthermore, ethnic differences are impossible to determine because the subjects were allowed to put multiple ethnicities. As we can see from the total sample size, uh, the ethnicities, if you add them up, which is the block below the red arrow, add up to about 40% more than the total sample size at the top. That means the ethnic data is meaningless because we don't know how many dips they've had at the pudding. Um, but this survey is constantly used by the DHB in advising the public, councillors and politicians. Real life data is harder to argue with. In fact, the difference in decay rates in New Zealand between those living in fluoridated and unfluoridated areas is not uh, clinically significant. And this was reported in the New Zealand Dental Journal in 1981 by the Principal Dental Officer John Cohoon, and again in 1998 by the then Principal Dental Officer Betty De Leeft. It's nothing new. Can anyone see a 40% reduction in tooth decay there? 
as I can't. If we look uh, at the breakdown of, of the data from the 2011, which was the latest uh, data that has been published, well, they, they did publish 2012 for a short time, but they took it down after I commented on how well the Northland figures looked this year. So we can, we can see from there, every year they, they measure the decay rates in about 90,000 children. Now, this is a much better sample size than the 60 that they make the policy on, um, I think you'd agree. Um, we can see that in five-year-olds, percent carries free, 59.91 carries free in fluoridated areas, 59.18 in non-fluoridated a great difference of 0.73 of a percent. Um, year eight, the difference is about 3%. The DMFT, if, if you're all familiar, the decayed missing and filled teeth difference in five-year-olds is 0.13 of a tooth, and in the year eight, 0.2 of a tooth. What that means is, year eight, you're looking at 12 and 13-year-olds. By that time, their permanent teeth have been in their mouths for up to six years. Um, and by that stage, the ones that don't have fluoride have got, after six years, they've got 0.2 of a filling more than the other lot. I don't think that's very significant. Uh, if you break it down to regional data, that gives us an interesting picture. Uh, fluoride, fluoridated is in green, non-fluoridated is in red. Um, we see a lot of interesting things there. The urban areas have lower decay rates than the rural areas. And note also that in many areas there is less decay in non-fluoridated than in fluoridated areas. So overall there is no difference. The fact that in New Zealand water fluoridation makes no difference to decay rate was reported by Colquhoun, as I mentioned earlier, in 1981. He did this graph. Uh, he described the differences in the decay rate in permanent teeth between fluoridated Betty de Left also referred to this in 1998, and she described the differences in the decay rate as clinically meaningless. And there's been more recent research. Kenna Garetnam in 2009 looked at Auckland populations and he concluded, quote, no significant difference was found between residential fluoridation history and dental caries in the permanent dentition. The evidence is quite clear that water fluoridation is ineffective in the general community. Same thing in the United States, large survey of school children, no difference between fluoridated, non-fluoridated and partially fluoridated. The references to these are in red at the bottom. And if you look on the global picture, many of you will have seen this graph many times, but uh, there's no difference whether countries fluoridate or non -flu don't fluoridate in the decay rate. Uh, it's come down at the same rate. And also, if we look at Cessation studies, in places that have stopped fluoridation, decay has not increased and has even decreased. There we go. Uh, that shows Timaru, fluoridated until 1985, uh, decay rate 3.7, and after stopping fluoridation, it has dropped to just over one. This is despite the fluoride promoter's dire warnings of dental apocalypse. Does this look like a difference of one-fifth of a tooth surface decayed? Any health groups misinterpreting early childhood caries as being due to lack of fluoride in the water are either completely ignorant or deliberately misleading the public, in my opinion. Either way, I'm not happy with paying their wages. The irony is that a lot of poorly informed young parents will lose their focus on the real preventive measures because they think fluoridated water will save them. This is the next myth, if we can get it to play. Even if you brush your teeth frequently, visit the dentist regularly and have low sugar intake, water fluoridation provides an additional benefit. It's not a question of one or another. We need them all. So let's look at the science quickly. Uh, for 50 years, fluoridation promoters insisted that people had to swallow fluoride while teeth were developing to make them more resistant to decay. This theory was proven false conclusively in the 1980s, although many dentists are still confused about this. We now know the effect of fluoride is topical and that fluoride in the mouth after teeth have emerged can help reverse decay in two ways. By encouraging the remineralization of early curious lesions and by damaging the bacteria in the plaque. 
the weight of evidence is indisputable. Dr. Broadbent's statements are at odds with current day knowledge of the mechanism of tooth decay and the action of fluoride. Tooth decay occurs because bacterial plaque growing on the enamel surface can convert sugars into acid which dissolves the enamel. Early cavities are called white spot lesions and it's shown as the dark area on that picture inside the enamel. Um, they occur just below the surface and they can be remo reversed by removing the plaque by toothbrushing, reducing sugars and changing the concentrations of ions in the saliva such as calcium phosphate, magnesium and fluoride. The overall balance of factors has been described by Featherston as the Kerry's balance and this determines whether or not the white spot lesion will move towards cavity formation or remineralize. So the factors that encourage the loss of mineral is sugar and plaque. The factors that encourage it to be redeposited is uh, salivary flow and content, diet without sugar, cleaning and some of the minerals in the diet. This picture shows the enamel in a state of early caries. Fluoride in the fluid between the enamel prisms, made of hydroxyapatite, uh, encourages the remineralization of the early cavity if it is available in sufficient concentration. Such concentrations required cannot be achieved by water fluoridation at one part per million. It can only occur after the use of toothpaste and other topical fluorides which have 1,000 times higher fluoride concentrations. Further, the fluoride ions bind to the outer layers of the plaque and must work their way through it to reach the enamel surface to have any benefit. There needs to be a biofilm present of around 200 microns thickness in order to trap the fluoride ions to start with, but fluoride is unlikely to reach the enamel surface if the plaque thickness is more than 500 microns, or half a millimetre in thickness. Fluoridated water provides salivary concentrations of up to 0.016 part per million, which is a lot less than the 0.3 part per million required to have any effect on reversing decay if the other conditions are ideal. After the topical use of a high fluoride concentration toothpaste or mouth rinse, the highly reactive fluoride ions attach to the cheeks, tongue and other soft tissues in the mouth and are slowly released into the saliva over a few hours. It is in this time that remineralization of white spot lesions may occur if the plaque is of the right thickness. There's some references, there's a big body of evidence on this. It appears that the only result from swallowing fluoride in any form, be it water, tablets or toothpaste, is potential toxicity and harm to the general health. Video. It's safe. It's absolutely clear that the levels of fluoride are put into New Zealand's water supply and are carefully regulated, are safe, they have real health benefits and there are no health risks. Now, fluorosis, although fluoridated water has no obvious benefit in reducing tooth decay, it is well recognised as the main cause, probably the only cause, of dental fluorosis. Dental fluorosis results from the toxic effects of fluoride disrupting the cells which lay down enamel during tooth development, leading to porosities in the enamel structure. These porosities lead to discolorations of the enamel and can contribute to weakness of the tooth and possibly tooth fracture later in life. Organisations claiming that fluorosis is only of cosmetic concern and even that it makes teeth more attractive simply illustrates their strong bias and desire to mislead. These are photos from my own practice. The teeth on the left would be classed as very mild fluorosis. You may not be able to see much there. Um, and the ones on the right, moderate fluorosis, which is generally very unsightly. And people either have to pay a lot of money to get that fixed or they go through life being embarrassed. At 0.7 parts per million, around 40% of people have dental fluorosis with five, probably the 40% which are fluoridated, with 5% moderate fluorosis and requiring treatment. In a population of 500,000, as in Wellington, 5% would be 25,000 people. It's hard to accept that water fluoridation is causing this damage in 40% of the community, but has no effect on any other cells or organ systems in the body. 
We know it damages plaque bacteria, and the reason silico fluorides make such a great insecticide and pesticide is not because it gives the insects fluorosis. In fact, water fluoridation has never been proven to be safe with long-term ingestion. The major studies have repeatedly raised many health concerns and have called for more research to be done into health problems. It hasn't. While the Health Department assures us that the concentration of fluoride in public water is carefully, carefully monitored, there's no monitoring of the dose being consumed by the person at the other end of the tap, nor of their age, weight, medical condition and overall fluoride intake from other sources. Instead, the red flags have been ignored by health departments with a pro-fluoridation agenda, causing the researchers involved to protest, as in this letter in 2001 by Trevor Sheldon, head of the research team on the York Report, he says, I'm concerned that the results of the review have been widely misrepresented. The review did not show water fluoridation to be safe. There was little evidence to show that water fluoridation has re reduced social inequalities in dental health. The review could come to no conclusion as to the cost effectiveness of water fluoridation or whether there are different effects between natural or artificial fluoridation. There is disagreement among scientists as to how the industrial silico fluorides added to water behave differently from naturally occurring calcium fluoride. The science is not settled. This paper by Sauherber last year gives a good analysis of the problem. Our role is to monitor and critically appraise reviews of national and international research looking at water fluoridation. These ongoing reviews have found nothing to substantiate claims of negative health effects associated with water fluoridation. Uh, the NFIS was set up by our Health Department in two 2010 as an independent consortium of scientists to advise of new research which may suggest a change to their existing pro-fluoride agenda. It has, however, proved to be a bit of a one-eyed watchdog whose selection and interpretation of studies appear heavily biased in favour of maintaining the status quo. Their refusal to discuss their recommendations transparently in a forum such as this is, in my opinion, a major dereliction of duty and must put their credibility into serious question. Thank you.